American history is all history. It must be told the truth, no matter if it's good, no matter if it's bad. We must know all of our history to heal, to grow, and to make sure it doesn't repeat. All history is our history. Former 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick takes a knee during the National Anthem in San Francisco last year. We noticed, but very few players joined him. Not many players seem to care. He can't get a job in the NFL now, and very few have said much about that either. But the president says he wants that peaceful protest to stop. Says those players should be fired if they take a knee during the anthem, and calls those players a name I never thought I'd live long enough to hear a president say, and now everybody cares. Donald Trump has said he supports a peaceful protest because it's an American's right. But not this protest, and there's the problem. Any protest you don't agree with is a protest that should be stopped. Martin Luther King should have marched across a different bridge. Young black Americans should have gone to a different college and found a different lunch counter. And college kids in the 60s had no right to protest an immoral war. I served in the military during the Vietnam War, and my foot hurt too but I've served anyway. My best friend in high school was killed in Vietnam, and Carol Meyer will be 18 years old forever, and he did not die so that you could decide who is a patriot and who loves America more. The young black athletes are not disrespecting America or the military by taking a knee during the anthem. They are respecting the best thing about America. It's a dog whistle to the racist among us to say otherwise. They and all of us should protest how black Americans are treated in this country. And if you don't think white privilege is a fact, you don't understand America. The comedian Chris Rock says it best. There's not a white man in America who would trade places with him, and he's rich. It has not gone unnoticed that Trump has spoken out against the Mexicans who want to come to America for a better life, against the Muslims, and now against the black athlete. But he says nothing for days about the white men who marched under a Nazi flag in Charlottesville, except to remind us there were good people there. And when he finally tried to say the right thing, not one of them was called an SOB or should be fired. We have white men in America who wave the Nazi flag and the Confederate flag, and he's concerned about taking a knee because it disrespects this flag. We use that flag to sell mattresses and beer. We wear it as a swimsuit. We wrap our bald heads in a flag bandana and stick it in our pants because we disrespect that flag every day. Maybe we all need to read the Constitution again. There has never been a better use of pen to paper. Our forefathers made freedom of speech the First Amendment. They listed 10 and not one of them says, you have to stand during the anthem. And I think those men respected the country they fought for and founded a great deal more than the self-proclaimed patriots who are simply hypocrites because they want to deny the basic freedom of this great country, a country they supposedly value and cherish so much. Welcome to another Founders Friday on the Glenn Beck program. Um, somebody asked me just before we went on the air um, how these shows are being rated. And I have to tell you, we didn't think anybody would watch. We thought, I'll give this a whirl, see if everybody uh, wants to watch it. They're wildly highly rated, and I thank you for watching. There is a hunger in America for the truth. And tonight, I think we're going to blow your mind. Um, you're going to have to ask yourself a couple of questions uh, by the end of the program. 
why why would our schools leave all of this history out? I mean, this is some of the the, the greatest American story uh, that you've you've ever heard. Why would they why would they do that? And it's everywhere. You just don't know where to look. If you take a look at the revolutionary paintings, the paintings of revolutionary times, uh, here it is, it's a Boston Tea Party, bunch of white guys, and then these people strangely looking like Indians, and they're not. Uh, but that's it, not a lot of racial diversity. Um, if you watch movies, one a great, great movie, uh, this is John Adams. You watch John Adams and you don't see a lot of racial di diversity. I'm currently watching uh, Johnny Tremaine. Uh, this is, uh, I love this movie. I remember this growing up. I was watching it with my kids just last night and I noticed there are a couple of uh, American Indians, uh, but you don't see any African Americans unless they're slaves. They will show people as slaves, but that's it. Now, I want to show you a painting of the batter, Battle of uh, Bunker Hill. Here's the Battle of Bunker Hill. Bunch of white guys, right? Unless you know where to look. Right here. That's Peter Salem. He was actually the hero of the battle. It doesn't look like he's a hero there. He looks like he's cowering behind the white guy with a sword. He was the hero of the battle. And he saved scores of American lives that day. Why don't we know this? Look at the picture of the Battle of Lexington. 150 Americans. There it is. Do you see any faces of color in this painting? They were all members of the Reverend Jonas Clark's church. They went out. They were actually, if I'm not mistaken, David, they were in, they were in church at the time, right? He, he called them together at church, okay. yes. Okay, so uh, we could call together at church and then said, let's go. And they went to defend their town. When the shot heard around the world was over that day, there were American, 18 Americans lying on the ground. What you don't see in this painting are the equal number of whites and blacks. They were white and black patriots. It was a mixed church. Did you even know that happened? One of those injured patriots on the ground in this painting was a black man named Prince Estabrook. I bet you never heard of Prince Estabrook before. How about the uh, painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware? Bunch of white guys, right? No. Look here, African-American, helping row the boat across. You know what his name was? Prince Whipple. He fought alongside Washington during the Revolution. Take a look at this one, this uh, painting of, uh, this is uh, the uh, Marquis uh, de Lafayette. He, if you look at this, you just think, oh yeah, and then he had, he made his slave dress up like I, I don't know what. But that's what you would think, right? This guy is incredibly important. This guy may have won the Revolutionary War. James Armistead was his name. How did he win the Revolutionary War? Double spy. I'm gonna let David tell the story here in a minute, but basically the Brits thought that he was spying for them, but he was spying for General Washington. He'd give the Brits bad intel and reveal the good critical information to General Washington. Did you know this story? Why? I, I'm, I'm so tired of people saying, well, it was just the white people, white people, white people. No, no. Why are we intentionally leaving others out? There are black founders. Come on up. This is our good friend David Barton. He is the founder and president of Wall Builders, also author of uh, Setting the Record Straight, uh, American History in Black and White. Come on up and, and sit here. Uh, we also have Lucas Morell. Lucas is a professor at Washington and Lee University in Virginia. Welcome. Um, and he is also the author of Lincoln's Sacred Effort. Okay. David, let me 
Where, where do we start? Maybe we should, maybe we should start with... Uh, James Armistead. Yeah, the spy. It's a great one. Because James Armistead, after the Battle of Richmond, he's in Virginia, and a lot of the battles did not happen in Virginia. But after the Siege of Richmond, he's there, he sees what the British have done in his home state, and he goes to enlist. He said, I, I want to I help. And he, he really, I don't know why, but he liked Lafayette. He went to Lafayette, young French general, 19 years old, said, I, I want to I fight with you. And so they make this agreement, and what happens is James Armistead goes over to Benedict Arnold's camp. He's a British general then, traitor. British general, and, and he says, oh, they, they, these mean Americans, they mistreat me. Uh, I, I've escaped as a slave. Please let me stay with you. And, and Arnold says, okay, you can wait on us. And so he, he is part of, of Benedict Arnold's staff waiting on Benedict Arnold. And Arnold's one of the generals, which means he meets with all the other generals. So he's meeting with Cornwallis all the time. And, and so James Armistead is just serving them and, and doing all the right stuff and just picking up intelligence like crazy. Every day he gets back with Lafayette says, here's what they're doing. Here's where they're going. Here, here's what they're going to do next. And he kept feeding the information back. And Cornwallis in this time got really comfortable with James and said, you know, I, I don't want to ask you to do something you don't want to do, but would you consider being a spy against your, your former guys there, the Americans? Would you be a British spy and, and, and tell us what they're doing? He said, yeah, I guess if you want me to, I will. You know, if you're going to force me to, I will. So he goes back. It'd be tough getting across the lines, though, but I'll risk yeah, it for I'll, you. I'll, I'll try it. Right. So he ends up saying, yeah, I'll do it. And what happens is when they leave Richmond, they decide that they're going to down to Yorktown, and they're going to go down there. So what happens is Armistead's fed all that information to Washington Lafayette. They're going to Yorktown. And he's let the British know that, oh, there's no Americans around down there. It's a real safe place to go. The Americans are elsewhere. So the British drop, the, the British fleet drops the soldiers off in Yorktown, and the fleet takes off because there's no Americans around. Right then, the French fleet came in and blockaded the port so the British couldn't get their ships back. And now we've got all the American troops waiting for them when they got up. They're pinned in on the peninsula. Can't go anywhere. So he probably cut months, maybe years off the revolution by what he did. Now, it's really cool. He, he liked Lafayette so much that he went back and got his name changed legally from James Armistead to, to James Lafayette. He, he loved Lafayette. And so Lafayette left America in 1784, went back to France. He came back here in 1824 for his farewell tour. Last time he's going to be in America, he's an old man. Uh, there's a painting of Lafayette that hangs inside the, the House Chambers, the U.S. Congress of Lafayette, the old man on his farewell tour. And everywhere Lafayette went, there were hundreds of thousands of Americans lying in the roads. When he went through Richmond 40 years later, he looked over and spotted his old friend James right in the crowd. Picked him out, called him a name. They went and hugged and embraced, and, and it was really cool. Why, why do we not know this story? Or, or um, because really, you talk to African Americans, and they'll say, "Well, I mean, I, I think I had Al Sharpton say this to me. Will you give me somebody like Rosa Parks up there? He said this about the, these yeah. three gentlemen. Yeah. You get rid of all the, the white guys. You give me somebody like Rosa Parks up there. Why don't you have any color there?" And that's what prompted there is, this show. Plenty. There is. There is. Why leave people like this out? Uh, let, me, let me give an example of, of how well we used to know this. You, you know, the, the, the painting you showed of Washington crossing the Delaware, this, this little jewel right here. You mentioned that this is Oliver Cromwell, and, and he, he is. But up here are Prince Whipple, but the other one's Oliver Cromwell. There's actually two blacks in the front of that boat, and they served not as slaves. They were free men who served with Washington on the general staff throughout the revolution from start to finish. Now, this painting that you showed was done in 1851 by a German, mm -hmm. and it was done in Europe. It wasn't done in America. It was done in Europe to show the Europeans, here's what the American Revolution looked like, which meant back then we knew blacks were involved. Whites were involved. At the back of the boat, there's actually a, a lady dressed up in men's clothes. Yeah, put this back up. Put, this, put, put the uh, uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware over. Um, because I, I find it interesting because I, I, I looked into the, the history of this uh, as well. See, so they believe <coughs> what he did was... Go ahead and point I, it, yeah, I heard this, right. is the, this is the lady, but who are you saying? Right there, right there. The, that's the lady. Right here. Right there. Yeah, and yeah, and okay. the two guys up front, uh, the very front guy, Oliver Cromwell, and you pointed to Prince Whipple behind him but there. I mean, th th this was done to show Europe, hey, here's what America did in the revolution. Right. Everybody came together. We don't show that today. I mean, it used to be that we knew. This, this book right here is an old textbook from 1855. It's a great book. It's written by a black historian, a first black appointed federal office. It's called The Colored Patriots of the American Revolution. Now, we studied that as a textbook. That is not a skinny little book that, that we have there. I mean, there's a lot of patriots in the American Revolution that we studied. I read black the, patriots. I read the book um, Giants and was 
uh, just amazed, just amazed at this man, Frederick yeah. Douglass. Incredible guy. We don't really even know. Most people can say, I think the audience would say, yeah, I can reckon. I know that's Frederick Douglass, but you're not really sure. He looks kind of just like a black Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you're, you're like, I don't really know his story, I think. Am I right? Right, Tell we have, story. we've got a movie about Malcolm X, right? Mm -hmm. Movies about Martin Luther King Jr. And for some reason in American history, we think that the only time blacks stood up for their rights was when Martin Luther King decided to leave the pulpit and hit uh, right. the stump, uh, the, uh, hit the stump to make speeches. Uh, the bottom line is for the longest time, we've adopted this victim narrative about blacks in the United States, that the only role they played was a victim to white majority oppression. When I teach my course on black American politics, I always stress to my students that when we talk about King and the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, we need to call it the modern civil rights movement because blacks yeah. from before the yeah. revolution yeah. were pressing, prudently pressing for their rights. American history could be described as one long civil rights struggle. Mm -hmm. Our first emancipation proclamation Declaration of That's Independence. Right. That's right. It was, but it was, it was, it, it, it's been this way. It's going on now. It's going on. Now. It's, it's, it's people trying to grab others' rights. And, and that never changes. That's, that's human, human history. Nature. That's yeah. human history. Yeah. If I ask the audience, um, when did America have its first African American judge? Yeah. Tell me. 1768. Wentworth Cheswell, New Hampshire, elected yeah. to office in New Hampshire. He was reelected for the next 49 years, held eight different political positions. Really cool story uh, about him is we all know that Paul Revere made his midnight ride. We also know he wasn't the only guy riding that night. Mm -hmm. Now the guy riding went with Cheswell, black and white. Riding now how is side. it possible? Did you know that we had an African-American ride to say the British are coming, the British are coming? <laughs> Amy did. <laughs> Amy did. Anybody else besides Amy know that? Two, three, okay, three people in the audience. He, that is, he, was, he was such a great guy, and we never hear about him because he rode north, and Paul Revere rode west. And Revere was going out to Reverend Jonas Clark's church because that's where Hancock and Adams were, which was him. And that's where we had blacks and whites, as you pointed out, laying on the ground after that battle. Wentworth Cheswell rode north telling people the British are coming. And it was from the north that all those people came to Boston to take on the British at Bunker Hill and everywhere else. So we don't hear about his ride because the British went west, and that's where all the action happened. But it was a couple of days later when all these people started coming down from New Hampshire and Vermont and elsewhere, and that's where he had ridden, telling him what was up. By the way, all of these people here, most people, these, these pictures, most people cannot identify them, um, but they all played a role in the founding of our nation or the refounding of our nation. Um, and um, these people are now in the textbooks because of Texas, yeah. because of what happened. These people, they fought to put these people in. Why would the left? fight to put these people in. L let me go back to the picture we had earlier of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Okay. So if you take that picture of the Battle of Bunker Hill, and, and this is a painting that was done in 1817, and the guy who did this, John Trumbull, did this painting. John Trumbull was at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He's okay. the guy who drew the, the maps for Washington, what went on. Mm -hmm. Over here on the right, we have Peter Salem. Now, he, he had 14 military commendations that day. He is the hero. They brought him in front of George Washington to get special honors from the commander-in-chief. He's the guy standing behind the white guy with the sword. That's right. Now, the white guy with the sword is Thomas Grosner. So you have Thomas Grosner and you have Peter Salem, black and white, fighting side by side. But Peter is definitely the hero that day. 1817, this painting is done, and all the way up until the 1980s, we knew that that was Peter Salem, the hero of Bunker Hill. 1980s, the professors got together and said, oh, no, that's not Peter Salem. Um, we think that that's Grosvenor's slave is who that is. It, it's, it's not Peter Salem. Oh, you're kidding. No, in the 80s, they, they changed that from Peter Salem to Grosvenor's slave, a Saba. And that's what they say, oh, no, it's not Peter, it's a Saba, Grosvenor, it's his slave. How come the guy who painted it and the guy who was there and the guy who saw it and painted what he saw had him as Peter Salem and now we've all convinced, oh no, it's just like, because we're into this thing where the founders have got to be evil, we've got to make every effort we can to make them, we've got to make victims and everything. Mm -hmm. These guys weren't victims. They were courageous Americans who won the battle and we, don't, we can't afford to say that. Okay. That'd make America look good. When did America have the first Speaker of the House? 1789. Wow. 
Details next. <laughs> Fridays. This is lost history in America, and you need to preserve it. Back with me now is David Barton, founder and president of Wall Builders, and Lucas Morrell, professor at Washington Lee University in Virginia. We're going to get to some questions in the audience here in a second. First, one thing that I think is missing in America, and it is the key to America, has been the difference between individual rights and collective rights and this man articulated that. In a speech entitled, Our Composite Nationality, Frederick Douglass said, I know of no rights of color superior to the rights of humanity. He thought the worst thing that could happen for blacks after the Civil War was to treat them as exceptions in the law. And so today, with the discursive logjam that we have over things like affirmative action and group rights, and the only thing that you get from government is if you ally with others who look like you or somehow are and categorized this is, like you. This goes into your theory that this is why this is not being taught, because you can't play the victim card. If you don't... It goes against the traditional victim narrative. Got it. After the Civil War, the history was actually written by the losers. That's the one time in history yeah, where exactly. the losers That's exactly wrote right. the history. That's exactly right. Really interesting perspective. That's exactly right. All right, David, explain quickly. Let's go through these people. Let's go through these. Uh, uh, this guy right here, this is Lemuel Haynes. Lemuel Haynes is uh, a soldier in the American Revolution. He's a black preacher. He's the first black preacher ordained in America that was a pastor of a white congregation in Vermont, Massachusetts, New York, several places. A, he, wait, a black professor in black a preacher, white... That's right, in a I white mean, church. Yeah, black, uh, uh, black minister. Black minister in a white church in four different states. He was ordained in the Congregationalist denomination in 1785. Mm -hmm. he received, he's the first black to receive a master's degree in America. He got that in 1804 from Middlebury College. So Lemuel Haynes, uh, every year on Washington's birthday, he preached a special sermon about George Washington, his commander-in-chief in all of his churches where he was. Unbelievable. So we don't hear about Lemuel Haynes. Uh, this is Benjamin Banneker. I think he's the most brilliant scientist in American history. This guy, wow. unbelievable what he did. He is, he's the guy More who, so than, than uh, Franklin? Uh, I, I would put Franklin and Banneker almost equal. Now, Franklin Holy did cow. a lot of inventions. This guy one time took a pocket watch. He, he taught himself how to read. He taught himself science. He wrote an almanac that 10 years ahead, he was able to predict to the minute, solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, 10 years before they happened. I mean, by, by watching the motion through a telescope, it, unbelievable what the guy did. He once took the back off a pocket watch, saw how it worked, went home and carved a wooden clock with all the gears mainspring and it was accurate to within one minute a year a wooden clock the Holy guy did cow. he's the guy who laid out washington dc he, he's the get the surveyor who did all that he's a brilliant mathematician jefferson Gave him never a, knew this. No. Jefferson gave him his example to France, said, hey, you guys in France think that blacks are inferior? Here's Benjamin Banneker. Okay, I have Jefferson two minutes that. total, so okay, quickly right there, and then we have one Right more. here, James Armistead, we talked about the first yep. double spy, really cool guy. This is Richard Allen. He's the first <laughs> founder of a black denomination in America. Uh, he is a soldier in the American Revolution. He actually is the first guy to practice medicine, taught by sign of the Declaration, Dr. Benjamin Rush. Just a really cool story. Okay. So, really cool. All right, good. Now, tell me. Here to these guys. Now, let's take the uh, now, full of the... Uh, of the first uh, representatives. I asked, when did we have our first black speaker of the House? Uh, when did we have the first speaker of the House? Uh, 1789. 1789. When did we have our first black speaker of the House? I bet most people would say never. Never. Except it was right here. Joseph Hayne Rainey. Joseph Hayne Rainey of South Carolina is first black to preside over the House of Representatives. Uh, these are the first seven blacks elected to Congress. You have here Senator Hiram Rhodes Revels, the first black U.S. Senator elected. He was a minister of the gospel. He was a missionary. He worked with Frederick Douglass. He recruited three regiments of black soldiers in, in the uh, Civil War, and he was a missionary to slaves in the South. Uh, you, you have here Benjamin Turner, uh, Josiah Wall, the large. Th this guy right here is really cool. Uh, Robert Brown Elliott is probably the most brilliant guy of that era. He actually took on the vice president of the Confederacy in a debate on the floor and just tore his head off. The, the racist okay. Alexander Stevens. It was great when, debate. When, when did we turn? Were these guys proud Americans or did oh, they say golly. we... we, we uh, they, th this is the epitome uh, of what we were just talking about. These were individual guys. Half of these guys taught themselves to read. Half of these guys were slaves and five years later they're sitting in Congress. And as slaves it was a capital offense to learn to read. 
So these guys in five years, and I guarantee you read their speeches and records of Congress, you better have a dictionary and a thesaurus in both hands because you won't understand the language that you, it is so brilliant what these guys did. And, and but were, they, were they there to say the white man is bad and the America is oh, bad? No, no. And the, these guys were, uh, Richard Allen, let me go back here. Richard Allen Wait. had been in slavery. Richard Allen was in slavery and he held no bitterness at all. He says, God would not allow bitterness even in Joseph when he was in prison. Do you think God will allow it in us? He said, we can't have bitterness. He said, by the way, there were some whites who held us in slavery, but it's whites who are working for our freedom. I mean, these guys had no right. bitterness. They, weren't, they wouldn't allow it. Back in just a second. Here, founder uh, and president of Wall Builders, Lucas Morrell, professor at Washington and Lee University in Virginia. Uh, Deneen has a question in our audience. Yeah, when did this rich history get erased from the textbooks? Lucas hit it. Uh, the losers wrote the history. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what happened was the loser wrote. The, I, 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 you really said something, put it together for me, because my viewpoint was, and you're going to love this, this is red meat for you, Woodrow Wilson changed oh, the teaching yeah. of history. So. I hate that guy. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson, when he came into office, he took every black in office in federal government and kicked them all out except one. He left one black in office. He is the he, first. He guy. resegregated the army. He resegregated. He's the first guy to show a film at the White House, and the film he showed was *Birth of a Nation*, a Klan recruiting film. He mm -hmm. called it hit history written with lightning. That's right. The NAACP, to their credit, boycotted that movie. That's right. So. Uh, He's the guy who wrote the seven-volume history of the American people. And that is the set that suddenly became the whole basis of the way we started teaching 20th century history. It's racist. Oh, it's awful. It, it's but he racist. has a Ph.D. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
invented a video home security system and applied for a patent, which was granted in 1969. The clever system employed a camera that could be slid into and viewed through four peepholes in her front door. The camera's view would then be displayed on a monitor in her home, allowing her to assess any potentially unwanted visitors. She gradually added more features to the system, such as a microphone for speaking to anyone at the door, a button to unlock the door, and a button to call the police. Her invention has had a significant impact on the security system as a whole. Her concept has grown beyond just home security, and her ideas can now be found in security systems in businesses all over the world. African-American inventor Frederick McKinley Jones is credited with the invention of mobile refrigeration technology. Throughout his life, Jones received more than 60 patents, including one in the mid-1930s for a roof-mounted cooling system that was used to refrigerate goods on trucks during extended transportation. In 1940, he co-founded the United States Thermo Control Company, later known as Thermo King, and received a patent for his invention. During World War II, the company played a critical role in preserving blood, food, and supplies. During his time, elevator doors had to be closed manually, often by dedicated operators. People could fall through the shaft if it wasn't closed, resulting in some tragic accidents. Miles improved on this mechanism by incorporating a flexible belt attachment to the elevator cage as well as drums position to indicate when the elevator has reached a floor. By using levers and rollers, the belt enabled automatic opening and closing when the elevator reached the drums on the respective floors. Alexander Miles received a patent for this mechanism in 1887, greatly improving elevator safety and efficiency. Although John Meeker had been granted a patent for his similar mechanism of automatic closing of elevator doors 13 years before. West invented the foil electric microphone in 1962 while working on instruments for human hearing research with Gerhard Sessler. The electric microphone has a higher capacitance than the previous condenser microphones and does not require a DC bias. West and Sessler maximized the system's mechanical and surface parameters. Nearly 90% of the more than 2 billion microphones produced each year are based on foil electric principles and are used in everyday items such as telephones, camcorders, hearing aids, baby monitors, and audio recording devices. West measured the acoustics of New York City's Philharmonic Hall. Recently, West collaborated with Eileen Bushkishniak to study the acoustic environment of hospitals, revealing that hospitals are generally too loud and that noise levels affect staff and patients. Dr. West has received over 250 patents and is still an active inventor in 2022, at the age of 90, working on a device to detect pneumonia in infant lungs. Thomas Edison perfected the light bulb, but it was African-American inventor Louis Latimer who came up with the idea of using a carbon filament to make longer-lasting light bulbs. After serving in the Union military during the Civil War, Latimer, the son of formerly enslaved people, went to work for a patent law firm. He was promoted to head draftsman after his talent for drafting patents was recognized, and he co-invented an improved bathroom for railroad trains. His achievements fetched him additional attention from the United States Electric Lighting Company in 1880, putting him in direct competition with Edison. While there, Latimer patented a new filament for the light bulb that used carbon rather than more flammable materials like bamboo that were previously used for filaments. The carbon filament extended the life and practicality of light bulbs that had previously died after only a few days. He went on to work with Edison at the Edison Electric Light Company in 1884. Prior to the invention of flat screens and high-definition LCD monitors, PC displays were limited to monochrome screens connected to computers with limited processing power. All of that changed thanks to Mark Dean, a black inventor and engineer. Dean started as a chief engineer for IBM in the early 1980s, leading a team of 12 people to develop the first IBM PC. 
He worked on the color monitor and led the team that developed the first gigahertz processor. During his early years at IBM, in addition to helping to create the company's first machine, the massive chip, which was developed in 1999, would allow PC to process data at higher rates and at faster speeds. That summarizes our list of the eight black inventors who made daily lives easier. I hope we see that it took all cultures and races to make America, because we are America. I'm Dr. Danny Hunt. We are America.